Yes, but hello everyone. Um, it's very nice to be in person with you all. Um, very unusual feeling. Um, and yes, I am currently here, although my team is in New York, but I have German roots. I could do this in German, but I'm going to do it in English. And currently, it does live itself better in Germany than in the US. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And like it was said, I work for the global health philanthropist Ray Chambers, who currently serves as the WHO ambassador for global strategy. As part of my role, I mostly work on community health and primary health care services with ministries of health and finance and many of the global health donors and actors. So I'm a mainstream health person. But I'm lucky enough since a couple of years to be involved, to have been involved with the inclusive health topic. Um, and I have been part of forming the Global Partnership for Assistive Technologies, AT Scale, and serve on their board. And I've been also lucky enough to uh, author the report, The Missing Billion, with Hannah Cooper and a number of others together. And building on this report, The Missing Billion, which was really addressed as uh, at the main healthcare actors, um, we've put together a couple of facts around COVID here uh, and also um, put forward some ideas for what this could mean for health systems in the future. So first of all, the facts, and again, this is what we did in the Missing Billion report, pulling together all the facts regarding mobility, mortality and morbidity for people with disabilities and all the SDG3 uh, indicators. Here, now we're showing this for COVID and what you can see is what is mentioned already before today here at this conference is that the mortality for people with disabilities from the studies and from the data we have thus far here, UK, US and Italy shows that the mortality is higher anywhere from two to 11 times. It is very notable that the UK established, based on their census data from 2011, that 59% of all people who died from COVID had a disability. So what might be the reasons for that? So first of all, people with disabilities have a higher risk of contracting COVID there is a higher reliance or there is reliance on physical contact for support and that sometimes makes, sorry, I need to move this, protection more difficult. There's lack of information. The videos I think have made this really clear today how this is an issue in many different ways. There's lack of accessibility of hand washing facilities was also mentioned by a Kenyan um, colleague today in one of the videos, and obviously there are inequalities, for instance, around poverty that contribute to this risk of contraction. Considerations, and I'll speak later a little bit more about uh, what to do in the context of a health systems framework, include obviously consultation um, of people with disabilities to understand their situations and the risks, accessible information, training of carers, accessible hand washing and appropriate PPE. So the mortality and mobility might be driven through a higher risk of contraction. Um, there's also uh, a, a particular additional challenges in the prevention um, uh, part around the lockdowns, distress through isolation, difficulties getting usual medication, and additional economic pressures that need to be considered. Here we've included some examples, good practice. This is by no means a systematic review, just to give you uh, some, some of those good practices that we've seen on the prevention side, addressing this higher risk of contraction. There's uh, an example of an inclusive device here for hand washing. There are others um, as well. Uh, communication obviously being so important. Uh, here the example of the Special Olympics that have mobilized um, around their athletes and the families, many, many uh, groups of uh, WhatsApp groups to distribute uh, communication. And there's a really um, recommendable review from Latin America around measures that were taken there 
there, and there were particular lockdown provisions, for instance, around um, cash to extra to cash transfers or also additional times outside when the lockdown didn't ex uh, allow for, for time outside. Um, so all of those um, are useful in addressing this higher risk of contraction. Then, of course, there's the other side. There is also a higher risk of a severe case um, when there is a case of uh, COVID, and that is for a number of reasons. First of all, a large proportion of people with disabilities is over 60 years, and we know that the prevalent or that the mortality is in particular high there. There's a high prevalence of chronic conditions. And again, in the Missing Billion report, we've pulled together all the available data on um, mortality and chronic uh, conditions. Hannah mentioned two times higher rates of, uh, of diabetes, uh, very similar and even higher for chronic um, heart conditions and other chronic conditions. Some people um, with disabilities have underlying uh, conditions or impairments, for instance, respiratory diseases, and in particular, come to effect here, there's a lack of access to services um, and attitude of health workers and the risk of discrimination that all um, contributes to a higher risk of a severe case. Considerations, again, and the most important is that national uh, emergency plans and national pandemic preparedness plans include a consideration for how a country or a health system ensures that services are provided to people with disabilities in the appropriate way. Uh, as part of that, what can be very effective are targeted outreach um, services, for instance, through community health workers, uh, and importantly, training of health workers and accessible uh, facilities. Before the good uh, practice examples, just to give one negative example, this is the case of a person, a, a man from Chile who uh, had Down syndrome and uh, died of, of COVID in, in a facility. In this case, uh, is now brought to an investigation in Chile itself, but also has already caught the attention of the UN Special Envoy for Disabilities and UNDP, given that there are um, that there uh, are issues around discrimination and triaging. I'm sure we will see and hopefully see many of these cases being investigated where there is a suspicion of that, but just to give you one example. However, there is good practice too that's been uh, observed. Obviously, again, this is not a systematic review and just to give you a few, um, uh, discrimination due to disability and triage is prohibited in the US, like in many other countries, but there is very, uh, the, the legal situation there is very strong. Um, in Canada, we, we've seen with great interest that at the presidential level, a um, COVID advisory group has been, sorry, a COVID disability advisory group has been established. So obviously that's critical in order to influence highest level policy. Uh, making in the UAE, testing for people with disabilities on COVID it can happen at home. Um, that reduces, um, is, is helpful. And then the use of community health workers to, for targeted outreach is, uh, is being done in South Africa and is being written up there as well. So these are all some examples of good practice, I'm sure. M many reports and reviews will focus on those in, in the month and time to come. We've spoken a lot about political priority already today, and obviously we would fully um, agree with um, the strong statements that Alakos has made around the lack of political priority. This is the key conclusion of the Missing Billion report that um, uh, inclusive health or the health of people with disabilities is not enough recognized in the global health agenda. But here I just wanted to make sure we, you were all aware of the political commitment that's been shown um, during COVID by uh, important uh, institutions, uh, IDA, the International Disability Alliance obviously has come out with very strong statements. Um, 
and also demands of the UN family um, that right around this time, WHO uh, launched the disability conservations during COVID outbreak guideline, and there's been from the UN Secretary General as well a policy brief, and so have been many others, but there's been considerable guidance and uh, policy briefs on this topic very early on. So, most importantly, what's going to happen after and uh, as a result of this, this pandemic, which we're still very much in the middle of, of course. Uh, one negative, very dire outlook, of course, is uh, the uh, economic situation that people with disabilities will face, which was poor to start with, and the, um, the challenges of this pandemic will make the economic pressures uh, even more so. So this is definitely um, something that is in particular uh, worrisome and inequalities will further uh, widen. However, on the more positive side, pandemics uh, and crises are a chance uh, to build better as, uh, as is now the big slogan. Um, but really the recovery and the redesign of health systems that will have to happen as a result of COVID, everywhere is a chance to do that with disability inclusive design in mind. And this is a point that my colleague Hannah Cooper is always making is that um, if we were to design health systems with, for people with disabilities, specifically, they would be a lot better for everyone. And this is the concept of universal design. So more specifically, what does this mean and how could we maybe create a more common narrative uh, around what needs to happen. This is a health systems framework. Um, there are many out there. We're working, uh, because I come sort of from the more mainstream health side, this is a framework adapted um, from the primary healthcare performance initiative that is being used or works in many, many countries. Um, you know, others could be used, but again, this is ours. And I just want to, we just want to use that to, to maybe give one frame for how you can conceptualize what needs to happen going forward, which is the following. And this is a work in progress, and hopefully in the discussions, everyone can add uh, or correct. But it seems that um, there are a number of really important must-haves for how health systems have to look like going forward. On the governance side, in-country laws have to prohibit any discrimination, for example, so triaging due to disability in pandemic situations. On the leadership side, people with disabilities work with dedicated leadership in the Ministry of Health. Of course, also with other ministries, but health systems is the responsibility of ministries of health. We have to have dedicated roles and responsibilities and accountability in the Ministry of Health, and people with disabilities need to work hand in hand with those um, in the Ministry of Health. And they need to work on pandemic-related measures, e.g. through a pandemic advisory group. National pandemic preparedness plans and emergency plans which will become even more so the focus of health policy makers and stewards in the future, have to include consideration of people with disabilities specifically. As we've shown, many national health plans don't include considerations, uh, nor do disease-specific health plans uh, include considerations. So it is really important to push for this, and this has to be a given in the future. On health financing, any health insurance, whatever the health uh, financing mechanism is, it has to include services related to the pandemic for people with disabilities and can't make any discrimination. Measures are also have to be taken uh, to ensure payments, for instance, disability allowances or support for transport, uh, that they can be made during pandemic times. And then fourthly, and very importantly, data has to be disaggregated and has to be collected on the outcomes uh, related to pandemics. Um, it's been mentioned many times there's a lack of data, and not in all health systems we have disaggregated data by disability, and that's the foundation for any action. Further studies and research, like uh, the interesting survey we've heard already today, but uh, much more has to happen so that the experience during pandemics can really inform policymaking. These are all what we call 
health system enablers, um, and these are some must-haves from our perspective um, going forward. On the delivery and uh, aside, both on the demand and on the supply side, uh, we've also uh, included some recommendation. Uh, on the demand side, information has to be accessible. Um, health access and support has to be affordable. And on the supply side, the health workforce has to be knowledgeable about disability and issues related to the pandemic and disability specifically. Health facilities have to be accessible and PPE, for instance, uh, used in this particular pandemic has to be made uh, available in accessible formats. And then lastly, there has to be a plan for the continuation of necessary specialist services and assistive technology distribution. Again, there will be, there are different frameworks for healthcare systems. This is just one, but we wanted to use that to conceptualize uh, how might one, one might think about health systems in, in the future and what to look for in the context of national health plans or national health preparedness emergency plans. Uh, we also wanted to bring back the overall uh, recommendations of the Missing Billion Report, which are, you know, very much apply to the COVID situation, of course, as well. Uh, we, we included here that policymakers have to recognize people with disability as a cohort um, that has to be included in the global health agenda. And that is, of course, as everyone is discussing here today, the case for COVID. Uh, governments have to develop um, health plans that include disability-specific considerations, and they have to collect data on health care access and outcomes disaggregated by disability. It's what everyone is, is also um, advocating for in the context of COVID. Funders, and we haven't spoken at all that much today about funders yet. Um, we've heard from some, but hopefully we'll also hear some more. But funders have to take a lens of disability to all the investments in healthcare. It's happening already now, uh, in many cases, luckily for gender. Um, uh, and so the lens of disability could follow that and all investments in health should ask important questions around whether the investments in health services are considerate of people with disabilities. And then for implementers, of course, as well, we have so many important implementers of health services, and they can ensure in their day-to-day -day delivery that this is inclusive of people with disabilities. Thank you very much.